I'd like for you to turn in your Bibles, if you would please, to the Old Testament book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 26, coming back to that time, Genesis 26. Why are you turning into uh, your Bibles on Genesis 26? Um, from time to time, we have some of our folks who are in uh, very difficult straits, and we always want to remember to pray for them. We send out prayer uh, announcements along the way, but uh, most all of you know Viola Brewer, and we're just going to ask that you remember her in prayer today. Uh, she's struggling, and we're just uh, asking God to do a, a special work there in her life and the family. Genesis chapter 26. The title of my message today is When You Are in a Time of Famine. Now, famine is, when we think of it, we think of it as being a time of a food shortage. And that, of course, is uh, definitely one of the definitions of famine. Famine is usually brought about either because of war or because of drought or because of plant disease or whatever. It could be a number of things. And the Bible talks about famine as, uh, as something that happens periodically. It's not without reason, but it does happen. And the Bible mentions several famines. And today we're going to look at a famine that occurred during the days of Isaac and uh, how God used this famine. And we want to talk about how to bring some truth out of his experience and apply it to our lives. Because famine can take many forms. A famine means that when you are doing without that which is essential, that which you've had that you need, it's no longer there. And as a result, there is a leanness that comes into a person's experience. For example, the Bible talks about a famine of the Word of God. In other words, it was a time when the Word of God was not being proclaimed, where it was not being taught, it was not being preached. And as a result of this lack of the word going out, this time of spiritual famine, the people fell into a lot of things that they would not probably normally fall into, and as a result, they were kind of left on their own. And the Bible talks about when people are left on their own, they begin to do what is right in their own eyes. And the last book of Judges tells us that that it was a time when everybody was doing what they thought was right. They became a law unto themselves. And if I think it is good and I think it is right, I'll do it. And if I don't, I won't. So there was a kind of a famine of the word, but there's also a famine of the law where there is lawlessness that takes over because the law is being ignored, disregarded, or just flat out rebelled against. And, of course, that creates a famine of, in society where there is a famine of peace because now there's a lot of civil disobedience. There is a lot of things that are taking place in the streets that are bringing fear to the populace, that uh, people are afraid of what this might eventually lead to and maybe the destruction of general society as a whole. So why? There's a famine of law or rampant lawlessness. There's also famine sometimes that occurs in relationships where um, people no longer sow into their relationship and as a result uh, there's nothing there to reap and that relationship, if it's a relationship with a spouse or a relationship with children or sometimes a relationship with parents or neighbors, sometimes even in a church and when those relationships aren't being sown into, it creates a spiritual famine. And you know, this is one of the difficult times in the church life. In so many ways, 2020 is almost a, well, it's almost a lost year. We haven't really been able to get together as a church. Uh, you can do the online thing so long. You can do the... Uh, uh, live streaming and you can do a few of the virtual things for so long but then we need each other we need the fellowship we need to talk to one another we need to see one another because those relationships in the body of Christ are so important 
Hebrews 10 25 says don't forsake the assembly of yourselves together why well because we need that mutual encouragement when God's people get together they pray together and that brings spiritual power they fellowship together that brings that emotional strength that we need and they share their requests and needs with one another and so there's mutual encouragement and when we don't have that there seems to be kind of relational famine that kind of takes place so famine is something that is mentioned several times in the Bible now here in the book of Genesis chapter 26 if you begin reading at verse 1 it says and there was a famine in the land besides the famine that was in the days of Abraham there's a reason why he refers to a famine in the days of Abraham this is Isaac's father and we'll talk about that in a moment and Isaac went to Abimelech who was king of the Philistines he went to the valley of Gera. Verse 2, And Jehovah appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Why did he said that? say that? Because Abraham had done that during the time of his famine. He left and went to Egypt. Now Egypt had a your round river that ran through it called the Nile and all of its tributaries and because it had the natural irrigation that came from that Egypt was a very fertile place and it didn't suffer uh, famines as often as other places in the Middle East the Middle East if you've been there it's kind of a dry barren dusty place and you almost have to irrigate with water and if you don't get the water you don't get the crops, you don't get the crops, you have a famine. But Abraham had gone down into Egypt and got himself in trouble. And uh, that's another story for another time. So God says to Abraham's son Isaac, he says, now don't do what your daddy did. Okay? It would have been very natural for Isaac to follow in the footsteps of his daddy. In that particular day, that's usually what happened. Sons tended to follow in the footsteps of their dad. And if he was a shepherd, you were probably a shepherd. If he was a carpenter, you would probably be a carpenter. And so on. If he was a farmer, you would probably be a farmer. So Isaac was told by the Lord, Isaac, listen to me. Don't go down to Egypt like your daddy did now when God appeared to Isaac and gave him these words he knew what was in Isaac's heart he knew that Isaac was very worried about his family which any good father would be you want to take care of your family and he knew that things were drying up the ground was dry and dusty things were just not looking good food was running out and people were leaving and I want to tell you, starvation is a motivator. And it's a sad thing. I remember when I was in the Philippines, and I remember when I was in Iloilo, and I was out in one of the islands of the Philippines, and while I was there, I remember walking down a street, and I remember seeing a child and I will forever have this image burned in my brain because this child was standing there naked. Its little belly was just swollen out. Now that's what happens in starvation. The children, their little bellies swell out. Their hair turns orange. It's a sad, sad thing. And, and usually it's disease that gets them because as I was watching and looking at this situation, uh, flies filth I mean it's all there and I want to tell you starvation is a scary scary thing it's something that when you see it you hope you never see it again now what really bothered me the most about this situation that I saw there the missionary I was with said to me I know what you're feeling 
I feel it too. But he said, I also feel anger. And I said, why? He said, because this little child is being pimped out by somebody. They give that little child enough food to keep it alive, but keep it looking pitiful. And that little child and those little bony hands standing on that corner as people pass by was doing like this. Wanting, wanting someone to put something in their hands. And I remember that, and I remember I hadn't gone too far before I felt some, someone tugging on my shirt. And when I turned around, I saw, I saw a skeleton-like figure of a woman, eyes sunk back in, face looked like a skull with just skin stretched over it. And she was saying something I could not understand, but again, I understood because she had her hands out. She looked, again, pitiful. So when I think of starvation and I think of famine, I think of these images that come back to me, and maybe some of you have had the unfortunate experience to see that as well. And I want to tell you, famine is a horrible thing, no matter what it is. And Isaac is beginning to see other people leave the area. And he's beginning to think, you know, I think I probably ought to go down to Egypt because there's food there. And God appears to him in the midst of this difficult situation, in the time of his fear, and he says to him, don't do that. Don't go to Egypt. Stay where you are and I will bless you. Now, you see, that takes a lot of courage, doesn't it? Doesn't it take courage to follow God? Doesn't it take courage to believe the Bible? Doesn't it take courage to walk the path of obedience with God? Doesn't it take everything in you sometimes when, when you're ready to go, you're ready to run, you're ready to move out, you're ready to escape, you're ready to quit, and God says, don't run, don't quit, stay where you are. Wow. That's when you have to draw deep on your faith and you say, God, are you trustworthy? Can I trust you? And in these moments, Isaac struggled. And God said, stay in the land of Gerah. Now, what is so unusual about this is that Gera is a, is a place that is inhabited by what we would call the Philistines, a warlike people. Their leader was a man called Abimelech. He's called a king. And Isaac is, laying, is staying there in that area, and he's kind of moved into there, and God says, now just stay right here. Now, again... I'm not going to all the story there because there are some tributaries that run off of the story that are filled with truth, but I'm going to just kind of narrow it down to say that while he was in Gera, God said, stay here until I tell you it's time to move, and I want you to reside in this land, what we would call enemy territory, the Philistines. Let me ask you this. How many of you believe God can bless you when you're in a bad place? Do you believe God can take care of you when you're surrounded by those who don't share your values? When you're living in a place where everybody around you has a different worldview, they look at life differently. They don't, they don't see life the way you see it. They don't worship your God. They don't love your God. And, and the things that they do are things that God says are not good things. But then God says, stay right there. You see, sometimes God puts us in difficult places because those people there where you are, maybe where you don't want to be, 
But where you are, God says stay there because you're the only light those people have. You're the only witness they're going to see. You're the only God they're going to really see in the sense that you represent God. I need for you to stay there. And see, this is where faith comes in. Lord, if I stay here, it's going to get rough. As a matter of fact, the word gera means a place of roughness, a place of difficulty, a place of no comfort. <laughs> Who wants to live in a place where there's no comfort? Maybe some of you think you're living there now. But it was not a place of comfort. As matter, you've heard me say this. God has never been committed to making you comfortable. That's not his goal. His goal is not to make you comfortable. His goal is to make you conformable to the image of Christ. And so sometimes when it gets uncomfortable, we think God's mad at us or God's chastening us or punishing us or something nonsensical like that. Listen, when things are going bad and you're in the will of God, and by the way, you can be right in the right place doing the right thing and be where God puts you and all of that and still have a tough go. So I want to show you the prophetic significance of this because Isaac, he said, okay, I'll stay. And he dug a well. And he was enjoying the water of the well. And not only that, but that water provided for his family and it allowed his flocks to grow. It allowed his barley and wheat fields to grow. As a matter of fact, because Isaac hearkened to the voice of God, stayed in this difficult place, and put down roots, and dug a well, the Bible says that in the same year that he sowed, get this, this is important, in the same year that Isaac sowed in obedience to God, the God who said, I'll bless you, in that same year, his crops produced 100-fold. How many of you want a 100-fold blessing? Now, I don't know how many of you are invested with your retirement in the, in the equity market or mutual funds or whatever else, but if you could find a stock that did a 100-fold, would you be happy? Yeah, you would. You might just go out and buy your boat. I don't know. A hundredfold. Man, this is another Apple. This is another Microsoft. Yo. I mean, in the same year, in the same year, a hundredfold blessing. What did Isaac do to get a hundredfold blessing? He stayed where God told him to stay. When everything within him was saying, let's go. Now I want you to show you how, how this was important. Isaac took the most precious things that he had. He took his seed. These are faith seeds. These are hope seeds. These are the seeds that represent the lifeblood of his family. These seeds... He can either take them and leave, find a plot of land that's fertile and sow there, or he can, by faith, take what he has, his very life, and say, you know, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to give what I have in obedience to God's Word. And can you imagine now, think about this. Isaac hooks up the ox to the plow. He goes out, finds this land that looks pretty flat, not too rocky, because I want to tell you, over there, if they have an abundance of anything, it's rocks. I mean, 
They are everywhere. Talk about Rock City. I mean, this is a rocky place. But he puts the plow in and he starts plowing the ground. And can you imagine if you're sitting up on a high vantage point looking at Isaac down there, a time of famine, and here's a dust cloud coming up behind him as he plows. And I'm sure the Philistine said, man, that Hebrew's an idiot. Why is he doing that? Don't they know? There's a famine. He's just going to waste all of that good seed. Let me tell you something. The world is going to tell you that living for Jesus, supporting the work of God, giving your time, it's all a waste. You could take that money and do something wonderful with it. Why are you wasting it? Why are you wasting your time volunteering? Why are you doing this and doing that? And I'm sure the Philistine said, this guy, you know, he's a nut. Laughed at him. <sighs> but you know, the thing that sustained Isaac as he was plowing and the dust was flying was he rehearsed over and over and over the promise of God. Stay and I will bless you. That there, stay, and not stay and I will bless you, but stay and I will bless you there. Enemy territory, yes. Famine, yes. Things are hard, yes. And then God says, sow into your famine. Sow into the hard place. And when he, Isaac, operated on faith, he sowed the seeds of hope and faith into this dry and barren land. The Bible says God so blessed him for his obedience that what he sowed came back to him a hundredfold. Let me ask you this question, folks. Does it pay to follow Jesus? Do you believe that? You see, for a lot of churches, it has been, hmm, church is somewhat of a social club. It's kind of a place to be seen. It's kind of a place to, you know, if you're a businessman, it kind of helps with your business. You know, you know I mean, it's, for a lot of people, it has been a convenience. It's been a social thing. It's been, but wait a minute, now it might cost you. It might cost you to follow Jesus. It might cost you to step in to obedience by faith and believe God and sow into it. I want to tell you, when God says to do something and you do it, wow, the blessings that he will provide. You say, well, my relationship with my spouse is not good then let me encourage you, sow into it. Sow into that relationship. You say it's dry, sow into it. You say I want out. No, stay right where you are, sow into it. Why? Because God wants homes and marriages to survive. He does not want it to bust up. He hates divorce. He says that. So sow into it. I don't feel like sowing it. It's sow into it anyway. You know what the result's going to be? As you walk in obedience and you sow into it. Now, sowing into it means that you're giving, you're giving it all you got. Instead of having an affair, have an affair with your wife. Sow into it. Because I believe that the hundredfold blessing comes to those who sow into obedience. You say, well, I don't like my situation. I don't like this. I don't like that. So into it. So into the place where God says, this is where I want you. If God has brought you here to this church, and he says to you, this is where I want you, so into it. Because as you so into it, 
God will bless you because as you give, you're not giving just to a church. You're giving to the Lord. And God sees it all. And he says, so into it. And there's blessing. Now, we don't give to get, but we know that God is such a rewarder of those who diligently serve him. So we give because it's a privilege to give. It's a way of worship. It's a way in which we watch God work on behalf of those who fear and trust him. Isaac sowed his seed. And the scripture says that that year he reaped a hundredfold. And the Bible says that the Philistines, when you look at the scripture, it says they envied him. Look at what it says. And let's go on down to verse 12. And Isaac sowed in that land, and he reaped in the same year a hundredfold. Why? Because the Lord blessed him. And the man became rich and gained more and more until he became very wealthy. He had possessions and flocks and herds and many servants so that the Philistines envied him. In that land, God blessed him because he said, I will obey the Lord. Now notice that he had dug a well. And when the people around him began to envy him, you know what they did? They chased him away from his well. So Isaac dug another well. Guess what they did? They chased him away from that well. So Isaac did what? You guessed it. He's a well man. He dug another well by Sheba, and it became known as Beersheba. Now you see, Abraham was a man known for his altars. Jacob was a man known for his tents. Isaac was a man known for his wells. He was a well man. He built another well, and this time they left him alone. Now, what's so significant about that? Well, a well, when you dug a well and it was springing up with water, this was like um, staking claim on a land. You dug a well, the well produced, this became your land. You staked a claim to it. So what God was doing was having him from Philistine territory all the way over to Beersheba, he was staking claims. Even though he was being run off, he was staking claims on the land until he got to Beersheba. He dug a well, and they didn't run him off. Now, what was he doing? God was staking a claim through Isaac on all that land. Why? Because God had promised Abraham, all this land I will give you and your descendants forever. Even though today that land is hotly contested, even though the descendants of the Philistines are still contesting it, even though the descendants of Esau are contesting it, that land still is God's land for his people. And there are claims. Every well, here is Isaac's claim. Well, and other people have it. It doesn't make any difference. It still belongs to Isaac and his descendants and Abraham and his descendants. There's a, there's a claim at well. There's a claim here. There's a claim there. When I was in Hebron about 35 years ago, I was on the West Bank, and I went to one of Jacob's wells in what used to be called Samaria. And I, Marilyn and I were there together, and drunk from that well. You see, even though it's West Bank, Jacob's well is there. He stuck a claim right there. So the West Bank belongs to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their descendants. Prophetically. But there was another thing that was happening. Not only was he staking claim, but each time he was pushed off the land and had to go further over and dig another well, what God was doing was he was using the hardships, he was using the conflict here, 
He was using all of that to position Isaac in the place he wanted him to be. Now, sometimes, folks, sometimes God will use hardships, unfairness. He will use conflicts. He will use these things to position you and lead you where he wants you to be. So sometimes if you're going through a difficult time, the question you need to ask is, God, what are you trying to show me? Are you trying to lead me somewhere? Are you trying to tell me it's time to move on? Sometimes God says, stay, and sometimes God says, go. Now, remember this. This is important. God doesn't lead us from. God leads us to. Get a hold of that. That's something you need to understand. You see, for a lot of people, and I've even known pastors do this, they get into a tough situation at their church, and they want to get away from that difficulty. And they start looking for an exit. But you see, God doesn't work that way. God doesn't lead you from God leads you to, and God opens doors. And so we need to be led of God, and we need to be sure we're following God. Because sometimes just because it's tough doesn't mean it's time to leave. It means it's time to sow into it. So in other words, be sure you get your direction from God and not your emotions. Because I want to tell you something, your emotions are fallen You see, we're all broken people, and we have, as a result of sin and the fall, we have a set of emotions, and they're fallen. And as a result, our emotions lie to us. And we say, well, I just need to follow my heart. Nonsense. Jeremiah says, don't do that. Who can understand the depths of the heart? It's a wicked thing, desperately wicked. Who can fathom its deceptions? So don't follow your heart. Follow God's word. Walk with him. And when you follow God, there will be blessings. There will be hardships, yes, but there will be blessings. And if you get ahead of God, you miss out on all the blessings that he has for you. And so, God can use the hardships of life to give us direction and to develop our destiny. Not only that, but God can show us things that we cannot see in times of prosperity. There are some places that God meets us in difficulty that he can't meet us anywhere else. You know, I think about all of the difficult places that God found some of his choicest servants. As a matter of fact, I want to go on record as saying this, I believe that God reserves his choicest revelations for those who are going through some of the most difficult times. He reveals himself in those extremely painful, difficult time that he doesn't reveal himself in other times. So sometimes the famine is the place where God reveals himself to you in a greater way than he ever could in a time of prosperity. When I think about this, I think about he located Lazarus on the fourth day and he was smelling, but God found him. God found David on the backside of the desert you see, God works in unusual ways and in unusual places. He found Moses in the desert. He found Job in the trial. He found the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace. He found Daniel in the lion's den. He found Elijah under a juniper tree wanting to die. He found Jeremiah in a pit. He found Peter in a prison. He found Paul in a storm. And he'll find you where you are in your difficulty too. Just trust the living God. And God said, I will use surprising places 
to bring my glory out to those around. Don't run. Listen, if Jesse, if Jesus was a root out of dry ground, if Jesus was a root out of dry ground, that's the prophecy, then he can make you blossom in your dry ground. Let me ask you a question. How well do you respond when God says, stay here? When you get a stay here command, how well do you respond? And so, out of this time in Isaac's life, God said, stay. I think of another famine that the Bible talks about in the days of Naomi and Naomi and her husband and two sons. They had a family confab and they decided to leave their little village of Bethlehem. The word Bethlehem means house of bread. It's also today in contested territory. I was just there just a few months ago and it is known as the house of bread. But at that time, there was a famine in the house of bread. And so Naomi and her husband and her two sons, they went to Moab. Now, Moab is Transjordan. It's across the other side of Jordan. As a matter of fact, from Bethlehem to where they were was only about 25 miles. Think of that. They left the house of God. They left the house of bread to go to Moab, which God had cursed that land and said, you don't belong there. Oh, but it looks so pleasing. You don't belong there. It looks like they've got plenty of everything. You don't belong there. Oh, they've got parties and excitement, and they've got, you don't belong there. I know, but I want to have fun, but you don't belong there. And people look at God and say, you're just a party pooper, aren't you? You really don't want the best for me. How many parents have heard the words from their children, you just don't want me to have any fun at all, do you? No, it's not about fun. Because you see, what happened was that when they got over in Moab, this land that God said you don't belong there. They went, they were motivated by fear, not faith. They got into the land, and yes, there was food, but there was a lot more. And the Bible says that Naomi's husband died. Her two sons had married Moabite women, and her two sons died. And it was time for her to go back home. And one of her daughter-in-law said, I'm not going with you. You see, what Naomi did, what her family did, they traded three funerals for famine. Had they stayed in the land of Bethlehem, the house of God, the house of bread, it would have gotten better because the Bible says Naomi heard through Ruth, her other daughter-in-law, that there was now bread in the house of bread. Let me tell you something. If you're in a place where God has led you, stay there, even if there's difficulty there because the good time will come back. The bread will come back. And they... She came back with Ruth with nothing. She said, I'm bitter, I'm bitter. And you know, whenever Christians get out of the will of God and go where they don't belong, doing what they shouldn't be doing, the result is always going to be bitterness. You will not find what you're looking for in the forbidden places. God said, don't for a reason. You see, Naomi traded three funerals for what she thought was going to be safety. 
And so trusting God is essential for the hundredfold blessing. The Bible says in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own what? Understanding. Isaac, his understanding, go to Egypt. God said don't. Naomi, her understanding, go to Moab. But God says don't lean into your own understanding and all your ways, what? In all your ways, acknowledge him. That is to trust him. And he will what? Direct your paths. And when God is directing your path, God blesses. God blesses. And that's what happened. Now, the, there is a verse in Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 17, verse 24, and it reads like this. Wisdom is before the eyes of him who has understanding. But to the eye of a fool, they are on the ends of the earth. Now you say, what does that mean? What this means is that the wise person looks around and sees what he has and is thankful for what he has. See, wisdom is before the eyes of him who has understanding. He sees what he has before his eyes. He understands what he has. Some people cannot see what they have. Why? Because they're like the fool. Their eyes are on the end of the earth. Oh, if I just lived in Hollywood, if I just lived in Los Angeles, crazy. But anyway, if I just lived in Chicago, it's even dumber. If I could just, you know, their eyes are on the end of the earth. If I could just be over here, if I could just be with that person, if I could just have this kind of a car. Then no, they are looking out all the way, looking at the end of the earth, and God says they can't see what they have. A lot of times people move to the end of the earth and said, I was better off if I'd stayed where I was. For what I was looking for over there, I couldn't see that I already had it here. That's why he says wisdom is for the eyes of him who has understanding. If you have understanding, if you're wise, you know that what you have is good. And you're not always wishing, hoping, longing. Some people wish their life away. They can't enjoy today because they're always wishing about some tomorrow. Now, I'm not saying don't plan. But what I'm saying is this. The wise person submits his way unto the Lord. He trusts also in him, knowing that God will bring it, whatever the it is, that's God's will, God will bring his will to pass. Trust in the Lord. So, sow into your hardship by faith, believing that the days of reaping will come. And God is the God who leads you to and not from, because it's always easier to run than it is to stay. Number six, hidden in every hardship is a future treasure. Isaac, your future is in this land. Plan a well. Put down a stake. Make a claim. Plan another well. Why? Because your future and the destiny of your children and their children is in this land. And then the last thing, it's the eyes of faith will always, always see what others cannot. The Philistines could not see how or why Isaac was being blessed. They couldn't understand it. You see, sometimes in the most difficult place are hidden treasures. Sometimes in that rocky, barren place, God has hidden a treasure. And he says to stay because there's a blessing for you. I close with this illustration. During the Civil War, there was a lot of destruction. And finally, the Civil War came to southern Louisiana. 
Now, about a dozen years before the Civil War, there was a soldier who returned from the Mexican War, and he brought with him seeds. He brought with him peppers. I want to tell you, they have some hot, hot peppers in Mexico. I, my neighbor in Chattanooga, Tennessee, Mr. Day, he used to grow these peppers. And I remember he had a little flower pot like this, and he had a pepper plant, and had little bitty peppers like that. And one day he said, uh, you want one of these? Like an idiot, I said, sure. I got a hold of it. I smelt of it. Man, that's strong. I kind of crunched it between my fingers. And then I made the dumbest mistake ever. I put my tongue to it. I mean, if, if there had been lava on my tongue, I don't think it would have hurt. Not only that, but everywhere my fingers touched, lit up. Rub your nose? No, don't do that. Man, I'm telling you, now your nose, you look like Rudolph. You're just going around. That little pepper was, I mean, little. But man, did it pack a wallop. He told me the name of it. Since I wasn't interested in knowing any more about that, I've done forgot what the name was. Well, this Mexican, uh, this soldier came back from Mexico, had these peppers, and he gave them to this man. And his name was Edmund McElhaney. And these dried peppers that he had, nobody in southern Louisiana had ever tasted anything like it. So he took the peppers and he took the seeds, and he had a big garden, so he was sowing these pepper seeds all in his garden. And these peppers were blooming and growing, and, and he had a bunch of them. And uh, then all of a sudden, the Civil War found his community. Soldiers came in, burnt his house, his farm to the ground. He fled to Texas, along with so many of his neighbors. All of their farms and barns and houses suffered the same fate. After the war was over, he came back, and he went back to his farm and saw his barns are burnt, his house was burnt, everything he had was burnt. He went out to where his old garden used to be, and uh, there was all these peppers that had just been growing wild. Now, he lived on this farm. This farm sat on top of a salt dome. He lived on Avery Island in Louisiana, still exists today, but it was a big salt dome. And all the other people just said, yeah, don't live there. There's nothing there that's salt. You can't really grow too good of crops there. But evidently, peppers liked it, and they just grew everywhere, just grew everywhere. He decided, no, I'm going to stay here in this barren place. And I'm going to see if I can rebuild. And so he took some of the salt from a mine that he opened up. And he began to experiment with some of the peppers. And he found an old barrel full of vinegar. Um, he took some of that vinegar. He took some of these peppers that were growing all over the place. He took some of the salt that was plentiful. And he began to experiment, putting it together. And he found over a hundred old perfume bottles, about like this. They were perfume bottles, and he emptied them out, washed them all out, cleansed them. And then he took some of his concoction of peppers and salt and vinegar and stuff, and he put it in those little perfume bottles, and then he would go to the stores around, and he would sell it. It became a hit. I mean, it just mushroomed. And places like New Orleans, they wanted it by the gallons. And he just kept making more and more of his product and selling it, and he called it what? Tabasco. And even today, the bottles still look like the old-fashioned perfume bottles, Tabasco sauce. 
He and his family, it stayed in their family for generation after generation after generation. In 2014, the company sold for over $200 million. Why? Because he stayed in the barren place. He looked around at what he had, and he began to take what he had and use it. I want to tell you, if you're in a barren place, look around at what you've got. Be thankful for it and ask God, how can you use this in my life and the lives of others to help them? Because I want to tell you, even though you may live in a famine area, even though you may live in a barren place, even though you may live in a very difficult time, and we right now are all living in a difficult time, we need to say, God, what can we make? What can we do? How can this be used for your glory? And out of this, what the enemy has meant for evil, God, how do you want to bring good out of this? Do you believe there can be some good to come out of this that we find ourselves in? Yes. But it's not going to come if we sit around and cry about it, complain about it, fuss about it. That's not God's way. Let's see what God has to say. Step into it, sow into it, and then let's believe God for that hundredfold blessing. I believe there's blessings to be had for the obedient. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these moments that we have had. Thank you, Father, for Isaac's obedience to you. And Lord, thank you for how you blessed him. Lord, he went through some difficulties, yes. He went through hard times, yes. But you were with him. You blessed him. You brought him forth. And out of that came tremendous, tremendous blessings for him and for his generations to follow even today. So, Lord, there may be someone here today. I may be speaking to an Isaac today who wants to run off to Egypt. I may be looking <clears throat> at someone today or someone listening to us on live stream who's thinking about just quitting and going to the far country, just running away, see if they can't find happiness somewhere else. Lord, help them to understand that if you have called them, that they need to stay so into that, and that, Lord, you will bless because that's who you are. No one who has ever followed you faithfully in obedience has ever been put to shame. And we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen.